it's Lara and welcome to my Lara Light channel. I thought I would go through some information with you around the invention and the start of the kaleidoscope because it's one of my most loved subjects. And I wanted to give you a bit of a history around how kaleidoscopes came about, who invented them, and what the purpose of the kaleidoscope was originally to what it is being used for now, which is something that I've been really passionate about for the last 20 odd years. So first of all, let me show you that most people think of a kaleidoscope and they think of something that looks like this. And yes, this is a toy kaleidoscope. This is a toy kaleidoscope made in England in the 1960s. In fact, this is original, made in 1968. And you can hear it's still got the little beads. And this is the toy that most children remember. And you can even still turn the front. But the original design of the kaleidoscope is a very interesting one because it wasn't made for uh, as a toy. It wasn't created and seen as a toy if you look at David Brewster's history and his patent of how the kaleidoscope came about. So that's what I want to share with you now, just a brief understanding of how kaleidoscopes came about and who Sir David Brewster was. <music> So I'm going to be reading a little bit from my book on kaleidoscopes, just to give you an idea of who Sir David Brewster was. All right, so this is, this is David Brewster. He's the father of kaleidoscopes and obviously looking at him in this picture, he's an old crony. But when he designed the kaleidoscope, he was only 34 years old. And he, it was like a hit and a sensation for 60 odd years. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to the beginning. So he was sent away to college. Um, first of all, he's a Scotsman. So he lived obviously in Scotland. And he was completely fascinated with nature and the study of nature. And so that he was sent to university where his parents thought that they should, because of his soft nature, he should become a, 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 a priest in a church. And uh, so he did. He went to Cambridge University at the age of, uh, I think he was about 10, if I'm not mistaken, 13 years old. Sorry, he was sent to college at 13 years old. And he was a bit of a child protege because he loved optics. He loved uh, discovering things and uncovering things and anything linked around the, the science or the physics or the mathematics or astronomy. He was a very curious child and he loved reading uh, incredible articles and trying to recreate these uh, different optics. And that's where his love for optics began. So anyway, he went on to learn something that was called natural science from someone called James Voltaire. And James Voltaire was uh, a, a very well-known guy during that time who himself taught himself astronomy and mathematics and um, philosophy and had a reputation for an inventive spirit. So, so David Brewster had a wonderful mentor who actually took him under his wing and gave him full reign to become a complete explorative scientist to understand the mathematics and the optics of science. And that was really his passion. So for many years, Brewster designed his experiments using simple throwaway items like glass bottles and pieces of wire. He was most noted for his construction in the field of optics that he when he studied the double reflection by compression and discovered the photoelasticity of material so again, from a young age, he was incredibly interested in understanding how light reflections worked. And in his later years, he was one of the first uh, scientists to understand and work with um, the lighthouse, the optics of the, the lighthouse lens. But France put their patent in first and they got the patent in. But he was also accredited to uh, many other inventions that came after the kaleidoscope namely those 3D uh, periscopes, those viewfinders, you know, as a child that you have. 
he was one of the people who worked on his design of the viewfinder if you remember looking through the viewfinder with the circle disc and the two photos so again it's the optics so he was completely fascinated with this um and then he started working on the polarization of light and he was using highly polished copper and brass sheeting and when he put the pieces together he saw that it made a reflection and that got his mind thinking now remember he's been involved with science and understanding science from like a really young age so now he's in his 20s and he starts working on this thing that he has no name for but he calls it reflective symmetry and he starts putting this design together and by the time he's 34 he's ready to take his design and get it mass produced which is exactly what he did so off he went and he started in i think it was in 1815 he took this design which was in a wooden box all lovely optical oh, i wonder if i've got an image of it So he took this design of the kaleidoscope to what was known as artisan optical specialists. They used to design all of those microscopes and telescopes. He took his design there to have the lenses made. It was a proper instrument. It was made out of copper and brass and it had all the fittings and trimmings. And he took that design to go and have it made. And what he did was, to his own detriment so one he took it to these guys to start making and two he took it to cambridge university to the science faculty to his classmates to show them what they thought of it and people were going crazy over it so the guys that were busy making up the pieces for him in the special labs that they had created to polish down lenses and work with copper and brass these tinkers of note and special designers were um, starting to see how easy it was to put it together. In their mind, it was easy because they saw it only needed certain components. So they started taking his design and mass producing it on street corners because people couldn't get enough of it. Now, let me give you a bit of a history of why this was so revolutionary. It was revolutionary because at the turn of the century, I want you to take your mind back and I want you to think to what it must have been like at the turn of the century, where there was no street lights, there was no electricity. It was England and Scotland and everything was being powered with steam engines and coal. So everything was gray, everything was dim, everything was uh, covered in soot. People were covered in soot because they were like working on the trains and there was a lot of suits in the air. Because there was no electricity, there was no light in the houses. So people didn't spend a lot of time indoors. So now imagine you're living in this gray, cold kind of town and you walk to the corner and there's this guy selling a tube for a, and it was called a penny for a peep. Yeah, penny for a peep. So what you would do is you would pay your penny and you would look through your kaleidoscope you would find this most incredible colorful world of patterns that would just be changing all the time so every street corner in london had a different kaleidoscope maker and tinker who was selling their tin version or cardboard version of the kaleidoscope and you could pay a penny for a peep or you could buy your kaleidoscope. It became an absolute hit. It became such a hit that people were completely walking into walls and into doors and kaleidoscopes just were like incredible for, for everybody at that stage, at that stage. So something to remember, kaleidoscopes was the first handheld mass-produced device that was used by everybody if we are to translate that craze that happened in uh, in the months leading up to when his invention became so well known in the in 1816 
it was like the latest iPhone had suddenly just hit the streets and everybody had to have one. Everybody had to have more than one. The more you had, the better. So everyone was walking around looking through their kaleidoscopes. There's even some etchings of people uh, trying to cross roads looking through a kaleidoscope and nearly being driven over by a horse and carriage. There's a guy who's riding his bicycle riding into a wall. Now for them to make etchings like this old image means that it must have made an impact. And in some of his letters to his wife, he writes about it. He says it's such a craze, everybody wants some. In fact, his wife wrote him, said to him, we've run out of kaleidoscopes, you need to make more. So within the first month of having a kaleidoscope uh, produced, he had sold over 120,000 units. That is phenomenal. No other toy in history at the turn of the century created such a buzz than a kaleidoscope because it was a world of wonder. It was a world within a world. In fact, there's so much to be said about it that people wrote poems about it. People traded with it. People started developing their own color around it, uh, their own campaigns. It became a political tool where the outside could be created to, to uh, represent your, your governing party. And it became so well known that the East Indian Company took the kaleidoscope all the way to China as part of a trade deal and also on the ships all the way to America as part of the trade trading. So kaleidoscopes became a wonderful commodity. So kaleidoscopes were a complete craze during this time. And um, its idea was so simple, yet it evoked the imagination of people. It stirred them up and it, it kind of became a frenzy. It's like us walking around today, holding a phone in our hands and not watching where we're going and falling into waterfalls and bashing into poles, which we've seen people do. People were walking around with kaleidoscopes glued to the eye because their houses were so dull. Their lives were so dull. There wasn't any brightness. There wasn't any magic. There wasn't any life in London and England and Scotland and France during the turn of the century. It was dark. It was cloudy, literally full of soot. And this was the real way that people found an escape. There were many poems written about kaleidoscopes. There were books written about kaleidoscopes. And Sir David Brewster took on the idea of turning kaleidoscopes into a way for people to find and discover creativity. He saw it being used as a way to embellish design and patterns for weavers, for wood makers, for artisans, to bring the design of formation together. Now we can see this very clearly in Gaudi's work, in some of Gaudi's ideas of the, the Spanish uh, artist, architect, but you can also see it in Ursha's work. In Ursha's designs, you can see he employs this very same design. See he employed some kind of a kaleidoscope design to create those uh, patterns. So the idea behind the kaleidoscope is really incredible. If we have a look at uh, some of the ideas, here's an original Brewster kaleidoscope. You can see it's very precision. It had a, a proper little stand. It had a whole working out mathematical that you could change the, the angle of the mirrors. He saw it, he called it an optical device. He saw it as an optical device. And this was his whole idea of not having it as a toy. There were all kinds of designs. People just loved looking through kaleidoscopes. It was one of the most fascinating things. And for over 60 years, kaleidoscopes were sold and made and created throughout the whole of Europe. In fact, there was remarks of uh, Sir David Brewster going through to Paris and seeing it on coffee tables at, uh, at uh, coffee shops in Paris. So you would go and have your coffee and on the table would be your kaleidoscope. In fact, it was so well known that um, people would have what they called parlor scopes. They would sit around at a table and look through their kaleidoscopes after dinner. It became the most amazing thing. In fact, it became the greatest philosophical toy ever because those worlds, 
those images evoked something in people that they didn't find anywhere else, that it had nothing related to earth. It was a beautiful, vibrant, bright image. Now we know today that those images are impactful. We know that while looking through a kaleidoscope today, it is a way to actually calm you down. In fact, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza, in his quantum becoming a new human or superhuman workshop, speaks about using kaleidoscopes because he says it's the closest thing you can get to that actually is a representation of what happens when you meditate, when you find your still place. This pattern emerges in us. And this is the connection that I made almost over two decades ago through my own healing, through my own working with kaleidoscopes. So this is the exciting thing of what kaleidoscopes bring. And to know that it had a very interesting history, that it was revolutionary for its time, that it exposed people to forms of beauty and and images of worlds within worlds that they'd never experienced before. It opened their eyes to color. Imagine in, in those days, there was no real color. You know, the clothes were drab, color-wise. There were no real vibrant, bright, luminous color. In fact, our own evolution of our eyes had not evolved to see that spectrum of light yet. So this was a forerunner. It was an optical device that literally allowed your eyes which are little pinholes to open up and absorb frequencies of light. So what happened? What happened with the kaleidoscope? Well, it was about 70 years, 60 to 70 years after kaleidoscopes were completely well known and used throughout the whole of Europe. Uh, so David Brewster was completely freaked out at the fact that he his patent was uh, entered correctly or petitioned to the court incorrectly and he lost his right to hold the patent because people went crazy when they saw it he couldn't stop it it was like a revolution it was completely mind-blowing so everyone was sharing making creating and by the time he got to the, the patent court to submit his papers his invention was already all over <laughs> so he lost out on that getting sole income because he thought that this was be his money making. I mean, he was 34 years old, you know, he had spent like from like 13 working on optics. So for him, it was an exciting thing. You can imagine, but he did make money. Obviously he kept them going. He did do his kaleidoscopes and it was only about uh, in 1873 that George Bush from, yes, the George Bush, don't know if it's the same family, but his name was George Bush in Western America created the Bush Kaleidoscope. And that's kind of what it looked like. Let me get it up to show you quickly. The Bush Kaleidoscope was very popular and being in America, that's when the Kaleidoscope craze then hit America. And because the East Indian Company had traded in Kaleidoscopes, they also got over to, to um, Japan and to China and then kaleidoscopes were being made there. And as we know, what, whatever happens in China, a lot of things get mass produced and then became the cheaper kaleidoscopes. And then it became even a bigger craze because more people could have them. And that was also a revolution on its own with uh, children in the 60s having the kaleidoscopes because everything is around those peace, power and love and the images were everywhere. So it became more of a symbol for peace and for um, psychedelics. During the whole psychedelic acid episode of our history, kaleidoscopes were also used. Um, and then the, the oil kaleidoscopes also became well known. Something interesting happened. I'm just taking you back to Brewster's story. Something interesting happened with Brewster. There was a few things, in fact, that I think most of it upset him a little bit. The one of them was his design was contested. Someone actually said to him that this is not really your design. You copied it from someone else. And he had to prove 
that his design was his design. And that was in those days done through letters and through articles. And eventually after a while, his article, uh, sorry, it was proved that his design was way superior to any design that had been created before and was nothing remotely like anything else. So in 18, around 1826, roughly, there was a playwright and philosopher of the Victorian America Times named R.S. Dement, D-E-M-E-N-T. He recalled a moment of discovering what was inside a kaleidoscope as a child. This was written 61 years after the kaleidoscope had initially been brought to the UK. And Dement said that he was originally fascinated by the reflections of colors bouncing around in a various symmetry but upon taking the kaleidoscope apart, he discovered nothing but numerous bits of colored glass without symmetry, unsightly in itself, and had no connection with each other. And by its very trifling value, he felt betrayed, deceived into believing that what he saw was at least the shadow of something real and beautiful, which in truth was only a delusion. He took the kaleidoscope apart, and he realized that it was made with nothing but little bits of tin and little bits of wire and little bits of glass and beads and there was nothing to it and most people think like that most people think well this is just a toy this holds nothing for me so what's the importance of it and i was one of those people i mean when i worked with my own kaleidoscope and when i started making them i thought they were toys that was what I thought. But that's going to be our next talk on my journey with kaleidoscopes and what I feel is important and how I'm going to be helping to bring more information and how you can start working with a kaleidoscope if you have one because it's way more interesting and way more exciting than you can ever imagine. Thank you. Catch you next time. Bye for now.